morning. Open your Bibles to James 3. James 3 this morning is our passage. Uh, just to be honest with you, uh, I know that I said that we preach the Word of God no matter what it says, no matter what we're uh, going through, no matter what we think about or whatever. Uh, but I asked the Lord if He would not let this one uh, be passed over. Please let it pass over, Lord. I don't want to do this one. Uh, this one hits closer to home than most for me and my own personal sins and struggles and strives. So, um, James 3 is a very pointed, pointed, pointed passage. Not that James isn't all the way through, um, but it is. And it should strike us between the eyes, especially if we're teachers. Uh, and this should really grapple with us, but even more so for all of us. Um, because this is something that all of us in some form or fashion struggle with, with the taming of the tongue. So as we're walking through this passage, I, I, I just want us to understand like the, um, you know, the old saying where you're growing up, uh, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. And we used to sing that, say that to each other, or uh, I'm rubber, you're glue, whatever you say bounces off me and sticks to you. If you didn't say that, then I guess you were not in the 80s. Um, so, <laughs> but it's, we have these sayings, but the thing is, is that honestly, I've been in fist fights with people before, in the past, not recently. Um, <laughs> And those wounds healed so much faster than some of the things that I have ever had said to me or honestly said to other people, which the Spirit still convicts me of, from my past. Words can be piercing. Words can be overwhelming. Words can be so sharp-edged and cut so deep that years later, they're still causing issues for us. Some of us have experienced that growing up from a parent or from someone in our life or a sibling or a friend or just someone that we went to school with. Some of us struggle with that because that's what our marriages were like or that's what some people that we've been around in our families have been to us. Some people, it's been the church that's done that to us. And church hurt is real. Uh, but the thing is, is that as we walk through this, hopefully we are convicted in our own hearts and lives to do what God has called us to do and how we live and speak and act and do towards each other. So if you are able, please stand as we read God's word. We are reading all of chapter 3 together. The word of God says this, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says... He is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide our whole bodies as well. Or sorry, we, sorry. If we put bits into the mouth of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird or reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening, both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water." Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have a bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere, and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Let's pray. Lord, we come to your word today. We want it to change us, to make us new. Lord, I pray that we are challenged in our own personal lives to take the word of God 
and to apply it directly to those places in our lives where we are not pursuing, not following after, and not being sanctified as we should be. Lord, I, I give you all the honor and glory and praise this morning because you are fully do it. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. So the very first point in our passage here, which uh, James is calling out, is watch your mouth. Now, I do have a picture to help illustrate this for you that I found humorous this week. Uh, if, if that's not accurate, I don't know what is. Um, it's one of those things that as I was kind of looking at it and laughing about it, as I was thinking about the passage, I even sent it on to Scott thinking, should I put this in my sermon? And he said, yes. So if you don't like it, it's Scott's fault that it's there. <laughs> but our first point is this, watch your mouth. And then I put dot, 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 heart. The heart is actually going to be overflowed and produce what the mouth actually says. James starts off this passage with a very pointed and should give us pause statement right off the bat. Because again, if we're teachers in here, whether we're the pastor, teach a Sunday school, teach a small group, whatever that it might be, we are going to be held accountable to a much higher level. James says something that should really pierce us to our core. And there's more going on here than not many of you should teach. There's a reason why he's writing it, but there's levels to why he's writing it. And he says, not many of you should teach, my brothers, for you know that we will, those who teach will be judged with greater strictness. First, he's addressing something in the culture. That's the very first thing is he's writing to these Jewish believers. He's addressing something in the culture because in the Jewish culture, it was a very high, prominent position to be a rabbi. People would pursue the position of rabbi because rabbi literally means great one. And so if I have this position of rabbi, teacher, great one, then in that position, I'm giving lots of authority. I'm actually given recognition. If I go somewhere, I'm given the best seat, the best places, the best things, especially if I'm a rabbi or a teacher and a priest in the temple. And so because of that, people were actually pursuing these positions in the early church because they desired this uh, this new title to be given so that they could have recognition, power, and authority. And so because this is an issue that he's hearing about from the early churches that have started amongst the Jewish believers, he's writing this saying, look, that's not the point of being a teacher. In fact, if you aspire to that, you better be ready because there's much more coming your way. But we can even look at Jesus' words for this in Matthew 23 where he says, everything they do is done for people to see. They make, their, they make their fallacies wide and the tassels of their garments long. They love the place of honor at banquets and, and the most important seats in the synagogues. They love to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to be called rabbi by others. This is how he's addressing the Pharisees. This is how he's addressing the scribes and the teachers. He's saying they love this. They adorn themselves in such ways that people see them, and when they see them, they, they almost bow down or kowtow to them in such ways. And this is the pursuit. This is new churches needing leadership, and you have these new believers who now are looking around saying, who's going to be the leader of this group, or who's going to be the teachers? The elders is what Paul will establish. And as they look around, and they're trying to decide this. Some people with selfish ambition were trying to rise to the top and be leaders. I mean, that can be... Even in today, a position that people would want for all the wrong reasons. There's people who have pursued the position of pastorates out of selfish ambition, out of desire to have some sort of standing or place. I'm going to tell you, if your desire is for yourself in the pastorate, look somewhere else. Or as Spurgeon and others said, if you could, he tells his students, and he read this in one of the books that he wrote. The first thing I tell my students, if you can do anything else... Do it, because the call is such a hard, strenuous one to the pastorate. I did not, my first, last, my last year of teaching, I was teaching, I was, had a student teacher that I was in charge of also, and I was coaching, and I was taking seminary classes, and I thought, it can't get more stressful than this, and then I became a pastor, and it became very clear <laughs> that it can and that's not a woe is me statement. That's a statement that if you're pursuing this for gain, 
There's not much monetary gain to be had. There's not much clout. There's a whole lot of stress that goes with it. There's a lot that, and you, you have to truly learn how to be a shepherd and a servant. This is, this is something that is not natural to man. So it is something that you're called to by Christ and that he will change you and make you and mold you over time. It is not something you go to to try and receive something that is not from it. Unfortunately, there's a lot of people that do. And now we have these ministries and people out there trying to make tons of money based on lies that aren't even biblical. I mean, it took me a long time. God, I know God was calling me to the ministry in 2008. And I started in the ministry in 2013. So um, it took a long time because I had to be really, really convinced by him through his word that this is what he was calling me to because it's such a heavy calling. Next, he's addressing, James is addressing those who are teachers are going to use lots of words. That's one of the things that's going to happen. As you teach, you're going to use a lot of words. You're going to say a lot of things in a short amount of time. In fact, there's, it's kind of interesting because sometimes when I preach a sermon, somebody will come up. And they'll talk to me after it, and they'll say, you know, you said this, and that really grabbed me. Well, in the course of the entire sermon, from, from my point of view, which is always and above, again, when you come up and you're like, good sermon, this is how this spoke to me, or whatever else, I'm going to tell you, praise God, because it's not coming from me. I'm not wise enough. I don't have great enough words. Uh, right there, that sentence wasn't even correct. So <laughs> I, I, I don't have it within me to say and do these things. I, I, my heart is that... The Lord will use what is said for his good and his glory to change our lives. And sometimes it will be this one little thing that in my mind I thought, this is just a passing statement to get me to the next thing. And that's what the Spirit used to grip you. And so we're going to say lots of words, and we have to be very careful about how we say those words. He's telling the teachers, you must be very careful because you can stumble in so many ways by the words that you're saying. So careful how you deliver them. Careful how you're saying them. We're going to say hard things as teachers. We're going to. I mean, if you're really teaching the Bible, you're going to say hard things. And if you're really a teacher, you've been studying the word yourself like I have all week going, God, if, if, if any way you can just inspire me to move on to chapter 4, that would be great because I'm tired of being convicted by this. But you've been preparing as teachers, those of you that teach Sunday school, and God has been working on you through that same preparation so that you can deliver the information to people and they can be changed by the word of God. So we're not going to back off from the hard things. However, whether from a pulpit or a classroom, we should never use the position for abuse. And if you're in here and you've ever been abused from the pulpit, I can, I can honestly tell you so have I. Nobody else knew about it but myself. But I was directly attacked from the pulpit before. And I'm going to tell you that that is wrong, sinful, and terrible. And teachers have done it. Pastors have done it. Religious leaders have done it. All kinds of things throughout history that has happened. That is not the position. And he's telling them, careful how you use and what you say. We're never to gossip, criticize, wrongly tell lies, slander, slander use any innuendo or anything else. Teaching or preaching to a captive audience can provide an opportunity for evil. But for a penitent heart that really understands in the grand scheme of things, I hold nothing that you need, only Christ does. And if I'm the messenger, I only want to come out of my mouth in my life what it is that God has for you, nothing else. I offer nothing else. And lastly, James is also telling him that we must, revi we must rightly divide the word of God. We do not have the right or calling to abuse God's word for our gain. Like those pastors out there that are constantly talking about, you know, give me money so I can do this. And it costs money to do this. And they're making big deals about making money. And they're selling a false religion to people who are just grasping for anything. They will be one day judged. They will one day stand before the king of kings and hold that garbage up to him, and it will be burned immediately as trash. God's word always stands above man's. If the desire of the teacher or the preacher is not to do this, but interject feelings and opinions and reduce God's word, they are not fit to teach. Are there times where we come to the Bible, and the Bible says really hard things, that I even want to pause and go, do I really want to live that out? If you're really reading the word of God, yes, it's a lot of hard stuff in there. But I've always seen the 
change in my life through the power of the word of God for the better. I mean, again, don't desire to be a teacher if you're not ready to be judged more strictly. We're responsible to deliver it clearly and to obey it. Romans 4, 14, 12. All will give account of himself to God. Believers, you will stand before God in judgment. Not for your sins because you have been redeemed and saved. But you will stand before the beam of seat and you will have to give an account. And you will bring all the things that you've done to him. And you'll say, here's all the things that I've done. A lot of it made of straw. A lot of it made of uh, wood. And it will be consumed by the fire of Christ on that judgment seat. And some of those things we brought out of gold because they were things done for him, for his glory and his good. And those things will stand the test of time. Matthew 12, 33 through 37. Make a tree good and its fruit will be good. Or make a tree bad and its fruit will be bad. For a tree is recognized by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you who are evil say anything good? For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. But I tell you that everyone will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. For by your words will, you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. That's Matthew 12, 33 through 37. That's Jesus' own words about what comes out of our mouths. We should really think about what's coming out of our mouths. And that's not just teachers. That's everybody across the board. We will all stand before him, before that seat, and we will have to give an account of our lives. And what do we want to hold up to him? The things that will be consumed by the fire immediately and prove to be worthless eternally? Or those things that were done for the kingdom that will last forever? And so James goes on to talking about taming the tongue, which again is probably for a lot of us one of the hardest things for us to do in our life. It is extremely difficult. I, I can almost guarantee that all of us at some point in our life or throughout our life has struggled with this sin. I mean, if we're honest with ourselves, we do struggle with this sin. I have had tell, I've had people tell me, well, I don't struggle with that. There's a famous um, writer. He, he's, a, he's a noted writer from the past. He's considered religious because he was a part of a group, but really not. And in his own writings, in his own journals, he wrote, I have found myself to be above all else. Because I do not struggle with pride. <laughs> I'm glad you got a good laugh out of that also. That is literally out of his own personal writings that he says this. That his heart is not bent on those things. All of us struggle. All of us have said things that we regret. All of us have talked about things or we've talked about people that we regret saying those things. And we should regret saying those things. Some are more blatant than others. Some are more out there than others. I have to be honest with you, in my life, there's been moments that I have been erroneously and terribly out there with my mouth and my tongue. Again, I confessed that a couple of weeks ago, that I used to take pride in my wit. I called it wit. I was wit. I was witty. I was fast with my tongue. And finally, thankfully, somebody just goes, you really can't be proud of that, can you? It's such a sad thing that we are proud almost of the way that we can think of something to call someone or say about someone. We tend to talk too much without really saying much at all. We wear our pants on our sleeves. And even if you are the kind that doesn't say it out loud, again, we have to check our hearts. Because if we say it within us, much like when Jesus calls out the other sins, you know, when he's saying, you know, if you've lusted after a woman, you've committed adultery. If you hated someone, you've committed murder. Much like those, he would definitely tell us that if you have hated in your heart, or if you have said these things in your heart, but it has never crossed your lips, you, you have still fallen into this trap. So you don't get a free pass because your heart thinks it, but your lips don't say it. Maybe your lips don't say it, but your facial expressions need deliverance. Like all other sins, this is a heart issue. Paul, when he is writing of human sin in Romans 3, 
will turn to the tongue also. And in Romans 3, 10 through 14, as it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. And when Paul writes this, he's writing himself here also. We have all fallen. We have all sinned and fallen short. That's Romans 3.23 comes right after, like in a short time after this, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. He's not counting himself as above anyone else. And James here says that anyone who has mastered the tongue has mastered himself completely. You have to understand in the original language, the way that it was written, this is sarcasm. If you figured it out, you're perfect. And nobody figured it out, which is what he tells us in verse 8. We're all at fault. We all belong to that club. But stop wearing your club jacket for everyone to see. James does a great job of illustrating how easy it is to fall into this trap when he brings about the bits of ma- and the mouths of horses or the rudder on the ship. I mean, I used to get real nervous. My daughter, when she was younger, and some of you guys know this really well because you've ridden horses your entire life or you love horses or whatever else. But my daughter was riding horses for a long time when she was younger. And it, it scared me to death because you have this massive animal and they are muscular. And if they decided that they were going to do something, there's no way my little girl is going to stop that horse from doing something. I mean, massive beasts of an animal, beautiful animals. But all she had to do is pull, 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 and that animal would respond immediately. My little girl could make a huge animal do whatever she was telling it to do just because that bit was in its mouth. The same thing with the rudder. Anyone who is in charge of the rudder on a ship, no matter how massive the ship, controls the ship. And our tongues, although a small part of our body, tends to do a whole lot more to cause issue and sin in our lives than most anything else. We can use our mouths for good or for evil. We can build each other up or we can edify one another. We can tear down and destroy others or we can make it our mission to love people well and to speak truth to them. One of the greatest times in my life that I probably was growing at different times more with Christ than, I, than others. We have seasons in our lives. And one of the times I grew the most was in college. We had a thing in our, our dorm. We had a Bible study and a group of men that were living together. And um, it was amazing. We could see each other on campus and we would say two things to each other. Don't let it steal your joy was one of the things. We could immediately would remind you, look, whatever you're facing today, ultimately in the end scheme of things, it doesn't matter more than Christ. And the other thing is, make sure we're building up and edifying one another. Build up and edify one another. Because in a group of dudes, we spend a lot of time making fun of each other. We spend a lot of time teasing each other. Because that's kind of how we interacted with each other. Sarcasm was the love language amongst us in our dorm. But we came to the realization that we spent way more time cutting down than we actually did building up. And so it became our mission for, for us in our dorm to build up each other. To use our words to edify and to encourage and to come alongside each other and to live in such a way that would honor God as opposed to tear down a brother and cause more issues for them. And it really is possible for us to start fires that will destroy. I mean, look at verse 5, the end of verse 5 here in this passage. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. The great fire of Chicago was started by one animal kicking over a lantern. And a massive fire ensues that kills over 200 people. A massive fire starts from a little spark in northern Wisconsin, and it will burn 10,000 acres of land from one small spark getting out from where it was meant to be. The pain we've caused because we have a sharp tongue, that fire can literally kill. That fire, that hurt that we have caused because of sin expressed 
in verbal form can absolutely pierce and destroy. And we as believers, this can't be us. And the sad thing is, and I'm, again, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in the boat. I might as well be sitting there talking to myself also. But we are so quick with it. Someone cuts me off in traffic. I could be jamming out to my praise music. Someone cuts me off in traffic, and I'm, while praising the Lord, also cursing his image. It really is possible for us to start these fires, and the thing is, is that we don't recognize how easy it is, and we don't do anything to quench that fire either. James is saying that those who misuse the tongue are guilty of spiritual arson. Believers, if you use your mouth to destroy and tear down others and misuse it for your own purposes, you are guilty of spiritual arson. It's not a small thing. James gets very serious then in verse 6. He calls it a world of unrighteousness. This is literally a sinful world system that you have entered into. You live in such a way that this cycle, this is what this means in the original language, is you have now completed the cycle. You have in your sin said what you wanted to thought it. You said it. You brought it to fruition by it coming out of your mouth and attacking someone with it. And the fire that is set has set the entire thing in motion, which will then cause more to come. When I build up and edify people, guess what they do back? They typically build up and edify. If I tear down and destroy and attack with my words, guess what? They tear down and destroy. I was out in public one time. This is a long time ago. And this guy got upset about something that didn't even happen. The guy that he was angry at didn't even do anything. And he started to cuss him up and down the other side. And he, the guy response, because of course most of us are assuming this is going to turn into a fist fight. This is before cell phones, so nobody's holding their cell phone up. We're all watching this take place. And the guy, in response, lets him get all of his swear words out. and says, brother, I didn't do anything, but I love you, and I don't know what you're going through, but if you want to, we can talk about it. Who expected that response? Nobody. I thought it was for sure going to be a fight. And this guy's response ended it immediately. I mean, how do you respond to that? If you're the guy cussing and the other guy responds that way, you don't go, oh, yeah? <laughs> A soft answer turned away wrath. The flow of our hearts out of our mouths are a fire. And if we continue the cycle that this world says for us to use our mouths in such a way, we are only going to cause more damage and burn others, and it shows our spiritual darkness in our hearts. It is set on fire. Now, notice what he says. It is set on fire by hell. The word here used is Gehana. This is the same word that Jesus would use for hell. Gehana was meant to give a picture of to the people of Jerusalem. Outside of Jerusalem was a, a pile of trash, garbage, that was constantly burning. And so, they would see this out there and see this burning pile of garbage that would never stop burning. And it's supposed to give this image of hell will be a horrific place and it will be constantly burning. So literally what he's saying here is if you live this way, your tongue is burning garbage to the world. A place of filth and fire. A tongue is an instrument for catching, encouraging, and increasing the fires of hell if it's used in an unholy way. Matthew 15. Jesus called the crowd to him and said, Listen and understand. What goes into someone's mouth does not defile them. But what comes out of their mouths, that is what defiles them. Don't you see that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach then out of the body? But the things that come out of a person's mouth come from the heart, and these defile them. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are what defile a person, but eating with unwashed hands does not defile them. They were so worried that they followed the tradition and do these things because if you don't eat it in the proper way, you're going to be defiled. And Jesus says, no. Because I will see what's coming out of your heart. I can see the condition of your heart by what spews out of your mouth. 
The tongue not only hurts some, but can be a fire among the body as well. Church hurt is real. I know this is talking about the whole body as far as our personal bodies, but this is also applicable to the church body too. Church hurt happens. It's too prevalent. If you've been hurt by a church, man, my heart breaks for that. Religious people will let you down. Religious people will sin and struggle. Christ is the answer to all of that. Church splits happen. When we see the world act like a fool and speak in mean, foul, wrong, abusive ways, first off, we should cringe because that should remind us of what we've been called out of. But we should not mirror them either. There should be something about the testimony of my life and the words that come out of my mouth that express my faith and trust in Christ. So this week, this past week, these past few months, has your life mirrored Christ in the way that you've talked about people, in the way that you've addressed people, in the way that you've expressed things towards people or even in your own spaces about people because it came from a heart within? This week, how can we put those things to death? How can we stop being the person that speaks those kinds of things about and towards people? Because the the power of the spoken word from an evil heart has started wars. It's caused death. It's broken families. It's split churches. It can do all kinds of evil. That's what James is getting at here. Literally, false testimonies in the history of the world have started massive wars that have killed Hundreds of thousands of people. Just from false things being spoken, sparked wars. I'll tell you what, in the heart of Christ, one false, one fiery, one unholy word spoken about somebody else tears at the fabric of Christ as much as the other things do. Don't get it twisted that, well, I'm not as bad because I've only lied or I've only said these things. It's not what Christ has called us to, which is, again, looking at verses 8 through 12. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. You are literally cursing at someone who is made in the image of God. They, too, were created by God. We jam out, again, to our music, and we curse out the people who have cut us off in traffic or are not driving fast enough. We have spoken poorly of someone in the body and someone else, or we hold contempt in our heart towards them. And then we stand before our Savior on a Sunday morning, and we worship. Man, if I'm standing there, and I'm worshiping the Lord truly, and I'm singing about grace, by grace I have been redeemed, by grace I have been restored, and I've shown zero grace throughout the week, I better deal with that before I walk up here. I better deal with that before I raise up a voice of worship to my Lord and Savior, Because if my heart is bent on self, and I'm trying to sing about God's grace and his redeeming reward, there's an issue. That's a conflict there. That's why I say when we take communion, if you've had bitterness in your heart and anger in your heart, and you're about to take communion, don't. Deal with what's going on in your heart before you do that. Judas betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, and we betray Christ for much less. And we betray each other for even less than that. Preparing your heart for worship doesn't start at 925 on a Sunday morning. I get it. I get it that sometimes getting here is half the battle. But at the same time, preparing ourselves throughout the week, preparing ourselves Saturday night, preparing ourselves as we get up in the morning to come and to worship, to lay down those things that we have held so tightly onto throughout the week and been so bitter and angry about or the words that we've used to attack. And again, if you know you've said something towards or against someone in the body, meet that person before you start the worship process and deal with that with them in a right, biblical, godly manner. Again, I'm challenged by this in my own life. I'm ashamed of this in my own life. Ashamed of it. It is only by the power of the Spirit in a believer's life that we can change, though, And what your heart meditates on daily will be the reflected attitude in worship. If I spend no time with God throughout the week, if I spend no time in prayer, if I spend no time really trying to pour over in what it is, okay, number one, we all go through those seasons. 
But number two, we will see a drastic decrease in our heart for others, our worship, our desire for the Lord, and everything else. Meditate, and your language will change. Meditate on the word, and your heart will change. Meditate on the word. You will love others well. Meditate on the word and let it change you, and your worship will change. Because only through the power of the Spirit in our lives can we. Number two, godly wisdom. True godly wisdom, this is something I, sh- I want to make sure we get. True godly wisdom begins with a humble, teachable spirit. True godly wisdom begins with a humble, teachable spirit. It does not come from having all the answers. We all know that church person that has all the answers and has no humility. We've talked to those people. We've had conversations with them. And in the end, we find out there's not a lot of wisdom there. There's really just a lot of thoughts and answers given. But true godly wisdom begins with a humble, teachable spirit that says, Lord, I don't know it all. I can't obtain it all. But Lord, teach me. Grow me. Make me new. Give me what you have for my life so that in my life I can reflect back to others what is true about you. Have a humble, teachable spirit. Well, this is the way it is. And I've been there. I've been there where I'm like, I refuse to believe that. I refuse to believe that doctrine. Because that's not what I was told growing up. What a terrible heart condition. Then over time, God graciously and faithfully from his word going, but it's true because of this, and it's true because of this. And guess what? It's true on this page. Oh, it's true on that page. Look, it's true on that page. It's, oh, it turns out it's true all the way throughout. Okay, it is the truth. Just because you grew up with it doesn't mean that it's true. Is it biblical? Is it directly from God's word? And if we lack wisdom in understanding it, what does he tell us in chapter 1 of James? Ask. And don't be double-minded. Ask, and he will give it to you. James made it clear to this point in his writings that a true believer will speak truth, live truth, and be active in the truth. The believer is humble. The believer is teachable. The believer is led by the Spirit. The believer hates sin. It doesn't tickle it. The believer lives their life in such a way that the world sees something different. If we truly live by godly wisdom then we are humble, teachable, led by the Spirit. We hate our sin, and we live in a way that the world sees something different. However, if our lives are marked, as he states in verse 14, with jealousy, with anger, with bitterness, with selfishness, with sinful hearts, then we are not displaying a godly character. He does not go so far as to say that you're not a believer if you're not displaying this kind of lifestyle, but he might He's at least telling us that we should test our faith, that we should put it to the test and say, is this true? Proud hearts, untamed tongues, angry dispositions, gossipers, mockers, liars are demonic and vile. James doesn't mix words. It's not, you're kind of bad. It's from the devil. And that should not be true of us as believers. Again, it doesn't mean we're perfect. No one is perfect. As he says in the passage, he says, no one's obtained this. However, we should be pursuing God fully. Again, perfectness is not obtainable until heaven. But it should always be our pursuit in our life with him. If not, that's a major issue. If your desire is to not be different by the word of God, to live differently, to have words that come out of your mouth, speak life instead of death, that's a major issue. That's something where I should actually question, do I know him? Because when those words come out of my mouth, I feel convicted about those words. When I say and do things, I feel convicted about those things. And if you are convicted, that is great because that is the spirit within you. And that spirit who gives godly wisdom, will help you put those things to death within you that are not glorifying to God. Seeking godly wisdom is seeking daily to be teachable and humble with our spirit. And in turn, being a humble follower of Christ who lives in such a way 
in this world that edifies, builds up, and encourages others in Christ and those who don't even know Christ in Christ to see this world changed for Christ. Our lives should be marked by a growth in the fruits of the Spirit. We should be marked by the growth. So three, last thing, real quick, what are we to do? I'm going to give you four points on what we can do in our life to be more like what James is calling us to be in godly wisdom and to tame our tongues. I mean, because the bad news is no one has tamed their tongue. No human, it says. In verse 8, it says, no human has tamed the tongue. So the good news, though, is if we're believers, we have one who can do this. Notice he says human. He didn't say no way possible to tame the tongue. No human has the power and ability to do so because we are sinners who sin. But through the power of the Spirit in our lives, we can do this. So first, pray that God would bring to light your sin. Pray that God would bring to light your sin. You may be sitting here going, I don't struggle with that. But if we took a poll of the people you hang out with and spend time with, like at work, you'd be like, if I put a microchip in your car and I could hear everything that's said on your way to work or on your way home or your way to do something or whatever else, please don't put a microchip in my car. (laughs) Pray that God would bring that sin to light. It took time for God to bring that to light in my own life. Because, again, I didn't think it was as big of an issue. I wasn't cussing. I didn't cuss, so that meant it's not a big deal. That's literally how I justified it. I was so proud of my not cussing. I was playing in a basketball game in high school, and the official called called me for a technical foul. And that was bad, because in the high school, if you got a technical foul, you had to run 100 suicides at the next practice. Not great. So because of that, I get called for a technical foul, and I don't even know what I did. I mean, there's times I probably had earned one, but not that time. And so he goes over to our coach, and he goes, all right, uh, technical foul on number 15. And our coach goes, what did he do? And he goes, he said a swear word. And my coach literally responds, I guarantee you he didn't say a swear word. He may have said something stupid, but he didn't say a swear word. So half felt good about that. I mean, I was so consumed with if I just don't say certain words, I'm really okay. But God really brought to light, especially early on in college and and, and throughout life, my sin. Ask him to bring it to light for you and to deal with it. Second, pray that God would cleanse our hearts and minds so we can be cleansed in our mouths. Pray that God would cleanse our hearts and minds So we can be cleansed in our mouths. Pray that he would break the cycle of your life that the tongue reflects. That we would not be those people that continues that cycle that this world expects. But instead, pray that God would cleanse you of those things. Third, ongoing prayerfulness. Ongoing prayerfulness. Hebrews 13, 15. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name. That's Hebrews 13, 15. Psalm 19, 14. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Ongoing prayerfulness. A spirit of right prayer can and will help break the cycle in your life of the issue with your tongue and your speech. Ongoing prayerfulness brings about godly wisdom in your life. It's hard to be in prayer with God and stuck in your sin if you're truly in prayer to God. And the last thing out of the four is this. Discipline yourself. Discipline yourself. Through the power of the word, through prayerfulness and everything else, earnestly attack. Again, in our spiritual lives, we don't go, man, I sure hope this, this, this dies. If I'm a general on the battlefield, I'm not going to hide out and just hope the enemy goes away because it won't. It will consume everything, eventually find me, and put me to death. If I'm really on the battlefield with my sin, I'm on full-scale attack, putting that thing to death through the power of the Spirit in my life, through the Word of God, through prayerfulness. But discipline yourself 
that when those things happen or those thoughts come or your life starts to take a turn, that you put those things to death actively and pursue the things of righteousness actively as well. Look, we can be a very powerful group of people as believers in this world, but we can immediately lose our witness if our mouth says the exact opposite of what we're trying to tell people is true about God. Because if that's true about you, and you say you're a Christian, why would I want to go that way? It's a heartbreaking thing to think about from my own past, and I'm sure many of you can relate. But man, Seminole First Baptist could be a, a lighthouse, a beacon, a loudspeaker to the world by how we live, how we go about the things that we do, how we love other people, how we engage the world, and what our mouths and our attitudes and our spirits are like when we engage this world daily. So will you commit this week to begin the process, to think through how do I relate to people, how do I speak to people, what are the language of my heart as it comes out my lips, and if you truly come to the point where you're like, i got to fix this, no, it's not of you, it's of the Spirit, and there is hope, but there's only hope in Him, and that's what the world needs to hear, and how can it hear from a church that defiles His name? I'm not saying this church, but this church is incredibly loving. You guys are incredibly loving. But as we walk out the door individually, and we're not in the power of one here as a whole, how individually are we living our lives out to impact the kingdom? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. Even though it pierces us to our deepest, deepest core, we thank you for your word. Lord, I pray first and foremost that you would change me as the pastor and leader of this church in my own heart and life in this way. It would be one of those things that I would be highly judged for standing in front of your throne if I were to call your church to something and then live the exact opposite out. So Lord, I pray that you would work on me, change my heart, my mind, my mouth, my life in every single way until I am completely standing in your righteousness. I know I'm saved. We know we're saved as believers. We 